Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to Collider Movie Talk, the best damn movie related show on the planet Earth, coming to you from right here at the Collider Video Studios here in Burbank, California. Ashley is out today. Sinead is unfortunately out today. So you guys get to look at this face. Anyway, uh, we are so glad you're joining us today. Joining me on this uh, light panel, if you will, sitting over here on my left. Hey, what's going on? It's Josh Knapp. Happy to be here. Uh, I was just recovering from uh, watching The Phantom Menace yesterday with these guys. It was a lot of fun. Uh, thanks for tuning in. We're going to be doing, uh, what is it, Attack of the Clones in the next couple of days? Right? Don't remind us. I, yeah, yeah. I, I, we, we're, we might be in trouble with that because Dennis is leaving. We might not be able, I don't know where we're going to shoot the one, hopefully soon. Anyway. Over here, Mr. Christian Harloff. Christian, how you doing? I wouldn't say light panel. We're a heavy group here today. Uh, because we just watched <laughs> Phantom Menace. Uh, it was a lot of fun, though. Yeah, I, I like that chicken. Yes, yes, the chicken. <laughs> yeah, I mean, people they, watched you eat it. You eat a chicken, yeah. If yeah. you guys have not seen it yet, uh, last night, uh, the three of us plus Mark Ellis, we sat down and watched the whole film, Star Wars The Phantom Menace, and uh, we decided it would be a good idea to put a camera on us and record us talking about the movie all the way through. You can find that on our YouTube channel. Um, it's crazy. We just put up last night, like 20,000 people have watched it already. So it's like, go on over there, watch us. We are going to aim to be doing all six of the Star Wars movies between now and when the Phantom Menace comes out, so join us for that. All right, guys, as we like to do every couple of weeks, we like to have an all-fan interaction day where all we do is take either mailbag questions or you on Twitter. So that's what we're going to do. We've, so we have picked out a few Twitter questions and what or a few mailbag questions, I should say. And then what we're going to do after the mailbag questions is we're just going to take your Twitter questions. So if you're watching us live via Twitter, Tweet in your questions. You can start tweeting them in. Maybe in about five, I mean, you send them in now, but maybe start sending them in in about five or 10 minutes. And then we're going to pick out Twitter questions and you guys will dictate what the topics we're going to discuss for the rest of today's show are. Probably going to go for about 45 minutes to an hour. Sitting here talking movies is going to be a lot of fun. So with all that out of the way, let's get to the first mailbag question today. And the first mailbag question comes to us from Josh Mattinelli, who writes... Just wondering on your thoughts about Simon Pegg Star Wars prequel rant today. Yes, you're allowed an opinion, but I find it quite disrespectful that Lucasfilm or Disney will allow this guy to have any involvement with the franchise considering he continues to attack George Lucas. He's had too many strikes. Time to stand up for George Lucas who gave us a, um, who gave us something we cherish so much, especially when the guy uh, spreading so much hate is one of the Star Trek Into Darkness crew, a film that is on par with Attack of the Clones. Anyways, thanks and keep up the great work. Well, for those of you who don't know what Josh is talking about, Simon Pegg was being, I believe it was the New York Post yesterday, was being, Simon Pegg was interviewed, and basically he has just done what he has always done professed his undying love for Star Wars, yet his undying loathing and hatred of the prequels. Mm -hmm. Um, to the point that he said, it's as if George Lucas was killing his own children. That's what he said. I mean, obviously hyperbole, it's an, al it's an analogy, so let him go on that. Uh, but I know, and ever since, there have been a lot of tweets. There's even been one of these, uh, what's that website you use to create petitions, like change.org. Change yeah. yeah. Somebody created a change.org thing, basically calling for Simon Pegg to be banned from anything Star Wars related. Calling on Kathleen Kennedy, Lucasfilm, Disney to ban Simon Pegg from anything Star Wars related. So anyway, Schnepp, you heard uh, uh, Simon Pegg's comments. Mm -hmm. Your reaction to all of this? It's a bit. I mean, ev the p everyone's reactions to his uh, to his mini rant is a bit extreme. Creating a change.org. Look, I just sat through the Phantom Menace yesterday and <laughs> was bored out of my skull. It's a bad film. That doesn't mean I'm anti George Lucas. I've professed that I think George Lucas is the whole reason our technology is where we're at right now. Nonlinear digital editing, the sound systems, everything. That George Lucas puts so much of uh, his own money that he made from Star Wars back into uh, the creative development of everything that we cherish. We'll always owe him that. And on top of that, he made American Graffiti, made THX 1138. He's done a lot of cool things. He produced Raiders of the Lost Ark. Give me a break. When, when people rip on the Phantom Menace, you got to just forget about all the stuff that George Lucas did, just look at Phantom Menace as a movie, and it's horrible. It's garbage, it's badly written, it's horribly directed. He had us an incredible crew of special effects masters working with him. Best in the world. Best in the world. Special effects at that time in 1999, Star Wars, amazing designers, Darth Maul looked cool. 
Lucas was just going through some dry spell or whatever. He just could not get the energy and the magic that he had when he created the original Star Wars and let a bunch of other people take it and write it with him and do, you know, produce Gary Kurtz, all these different people. That's how the original trilogy was made. So I was one of these people who saw the original trilogy and then saw the prequels later and was incredibly disappointed with those original prequels and completely 100% behind Simon Pegg's rants. And they're true. And if you don't like them, suck it. <laughs> I, I just think it's... Here's the thing. I... I understand that there are people out there who like the prequels, but here's the thing. I absolutely, this, this notion, when people are saying, Simon Pegg continues to disrespect the fans, with all the love of my heart, shut up. Just <laughs> shut up. He has never disrespected the fans. Look, I am a diehard, to the core, I bleed blue and white Toronto Maple Leaf fan, okay? Guess what? They suck, and they've sucked my whole life. Okay, well, there was a couple of years there when they had, you know, Wendell Clark and then Gilmore and that whole thing going, and they were all right for a couple of years. But for the most part, my entire life they've sucked. I love the Toronto Maple Leafs, though. Love them. And guess what? If somebody says to me, like uh, Josh McCuga, who's a, who's a Pittsburgh Penguins fan, I also am a big fan of the Pittsburgh Penguins, but he says to me, Yo, can't be a Toronto Maple Leafs suck. What can I do? I say, well, I love them anyway. They suck, but I love them anyway. He's not disrespecting me. We're talking about hockey for heaven's sakes. And guess what? I've said this before. I will say it again. I worship at the altar of George Lucas. That nobody has done more for the film industry in the last 50 years than what he has done for the film industry. But guess what? My favorite hockey player in the world, my, your favorite baseball player, or your favorite basketball player, what, whatever, can be your favorite in the world. And if they go out and suck one game, and you say, they sucked that game. That is not disrespecting them. That's you looking at the art or the sport or whatever and say, hey, that outing was not so good. I worship at the altar of George Lucas. But that doesn't mean I put a bag over my head, stick my head in the sand, and just go, anything he does is beautiful. No. I look at the prequels. You may look at them and like them. I look at them and I think they're horrible. That does not mean I am disrespecting George Lucas. That doesn't mean I'm disrespecting other fans. Look, I've called Man of Steel. I think Man of Steel is a borderline masterpiece. I think that movie is brilliant and I like it more and more every time I see it. Lots of people don't like it. And I have close friends of mine who don't like it and say, dude, that movie was rough. That movie just sucked. I go, well, I think you're crazy, but I loved it. I don't go, you are disrespectful. Disrespecting me! How dare you disrespect Zack Snyder like that? No, you didn't like the movie. You hated the movie. You thought it was trash. That's cool. I loved it. And we can have a dialogue about it. And that's all fun and cool. This notion of this whiny band of crybabies who are going out and trying to get Simon Pegg. Now, granted, look, let me call Space Spade here. I don't like the prequels. Simon Pegg doesn't like the prequels, so it'll look on the surface like we're on the same thing, but I don't care if Simon Pegg was going out and trash-talking Man of Steel. I'd be saying the same thing. Get over it. This dude's love for Star Wars is more than yours. He adores this franchise, and his love for it is part of the reason he's so angry at the prequels. That's the basis of it. Yeah. This crybaby mentality of, you don't like the same thing I like, ban him, is pathetic. It's pathetic. Get over it. Anyway, Christian. Here's the difference, though. Uh, you don't play for the Maple Leafs. That's, I, I don't play for the Maple Leafs, no. No, Simon Pegg's in Star Wars. Um, now, I love Simon Pegg. I share his opinions on a lot of the movies and for most of what he said. But he's putting his best friend in a very, in a very odd position because J.J. Abrams will most likely, I say, feels the same way about the prequels. You will never hear J.J. Abrams say those words. No, you will never. Simon Pegg has to be careful when he is part of this franchise now. He can't go shooting off about George Lucas and saying, because we know that he doesn't, we, if he had never said it before, and this is the first time he's saying it, okay, he just said his opinions. Oh, he, man, see, I, I'm, I'm the opposite of that. I think if he has never said it before, and then, said then it, I think you keep yeah, your mouth I mean, shut. I, if you're already on I know, record, I know, I know. He's not changing his opinions, and that's, and that's where he's been. No, 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 I get it. But, I'm, but what I mean, though, is the fact that he's part, the thing is, at this point, he is part, you can also, so you can say things in a way that he wasn't a fan of the prequels and that things should have been done differently, as opposed to right now, taking shots at George Lucas before he sold Disney, Everyone was like, yeah, get him, special edition. Why is that woman singing in Jedi? Get her out of there. Um, but that's not the case anymore. A lot of people, myself included, are like, well, look, George did a lot of bad things. He did the right thing. He sold it off. 
other people are making them now. It's good. Mm-hmm. It's like you got to let you got to let it go. Like I I understand that the, I agree with Schnepp. The movie Phantom Menace we watched it last night. It was tough to watch. Those it's, movies it's hard to watch. are hard to watch. People do we love them too. We tried to stay pretty positive though during that. We, 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 we did. tried and to I, stay as positive I, as we could. And I was reading his comments and I agree with everything he was saying in regards to what he was trying to say as far, as far as what happened to the tone of the movie and how they're not the same. And, and to say he's not a fan is ridiculous. And to right. try to get him out of the movie is insane. And yeah. the fact that you said Star Trek Two is worse than the clones, insane. Yeah, Different that's arguments. just yeah. nuts. But that being said, you also have to realize though you're putting you're putting Lucasfilm in a weird position. You're putting Disney in a weird position. You're putting your friend J.J. Abrams in a weird position here by attacking George Lucas again because it's going to get there. He's a beloved Star Wars fan. Right. He is. He's a loved Star Wars fan. And by 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 doing it, it's just it's it's you're just a weird position to to put people in. It's, See, I, I think I think the thing is, like I was mentioning before, I think I've got a little bit of an opposite view of this. I think if he if he like J.J. Abrams had never been public. Uh, about his distaste for uh, the prequels, then my position completely changes. Then I'm like, dude, sh- shut up. Sh- Simon, shut up. Yeah. Shut, no, I agree. With, I know what you're saying. I, I agree with that. At this point, I mean, this is the same guy who said he could swallow Sinai if he got a chance to hang out with George Lucas for the day because his life would be complete. Remember, this is the same guy that everybody's saying you're disrespecting George Lucas. I mean, you got to separate from him calling out the things that he thought was crap and not. But He's been so vocal and adamant about his hatred for the prequels. But over not years. since. But not since he was in the movie. No, no, not since he's been. Yeah. That at this point, though, you can't become disingenuous right. and sugarcoat it, or else it almost becomes a bigger story. I, I don't. But know. But you don't think there's a better way for him to say it? Like, you're like, look, look, I wasn't a fan. He oh, could have said something yeah, along yeah. the lines of, "Look, I wasn't a fan of the prequels. I thought the writing and the tone wasn't the same. I think we're we're doing it a lot different now. I think JJ has a better hold of it. What it was. I think you could have said it that way, as opposed Absolutely. to going, George Lucas, the man who gave us this, is 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 horrible. He's killing his kids. That's hard well, to he do never when you're in the movie. He never said he's horrible, but he just said it's yeah. like he's. Getting, you know what I mean? He said it's almost like in fan side. I I totally agree with you. Could he have said it differently? Right, that's all I'm I, saying. I agree. But over an issue of could he have said it differently to starting a change.org that's campaign, ridiculous. have him no, banned from I'm all things. I'm with you there. That's, right. that's so, totally ridiculous. I, I, how do you not want Simon Pegg? Could Peg he have said in, it differently? Right. Absolutely. I want him in Star Wars. It's Simon Pegg. He's an ultimate fan, and you know that he's going to help you. He probably helped JJ. He, JJ said as much. He was there to throw things back and forth. You don't want Simon Pegg off of Star Wars. Trust me. No, you well, do Simon not. Simon Pegg has been an advocate of not the Phantom Menace since like the Spaced his British series oh yeah where he really went off back railing on it yeah also yeah Yeah, I mean and it's like uh, that's just how he feels about it and sometimes the fan community that's the the it's not trolls. It's just this fervent, like you're either in or you're out. Sweaties. So you can't have. No, I don't. Th- sweaties are not like just like all in, all out. I'm just sometimes like sometimes they can, so they can be, but I'm just saying like <laughs> when it gets to this point where it's like you know you can't disrespect this person. It's like it becomes almost like a religious fervor. Like look, he's human. He's made a bunch of stinky films. He's also made a, a, an incredible series of films that's changed cinematic history and the way we see films. It help create the blockbuster the event yeah. film there's all these things that so when you when you talk uh down about george lucas's prequels i think that is a deserved uh, comment whether you like them or you don't like them i think it's an argument that's worth having i don't disagree that you can't talk bad about the prequels i just like i said i think that there's a way that you can say it especially when you're in the film that can come off differently than the way that he said it and i think that he also said it it's simon Pegg. he probably yes. was also saying it from when you read it in print to how he said it it probably would be humorous listening yes. to the, the way that he said it because it's simon Pegg. he's hysterical but when you read it and if you're someone who's just like Leave George Lucas alone. You're gonna get pissed, and I, I understand. I, I really do get both sides of it. I just think that it could have been said differently. I agree with you, though. I think it's still. This is a guy who's been very vocal about his opinions on it. He shouldn't have changed that 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 stance. But because he's in the movie and because he is, he could have just said it a little differently. And believe me, I agree. He knows how much weight is on him because he wrote Star Trek Beyond. Yeah, like and he's not (laughs) only Scotty, but he's the writer of Star Trek Beyond. So, you know. He's a fan, and I think him saying that stuff. I, you know, I'm glad he said it. I and mean, just to reiterate what Christian was saying to to equate 
Star Trek Into Darkness with Attack of the Clones. Come on, have you all films subjective, yeah, all right. films subjective. But from from where I'm sitting, that's a little bit insane. Yeah. But but hey, but I'm not going to try to have you banned <laughs> from any Star Trek conventions just because you think that. You anyway. have change.org up right now. What are you talking about? <laughs> I've already signed it. <laughs> Get this guy banned. All right, let's move on to the next question. And the next question today comes to us from Taylor Houston, who writes... Hey guys, love the show so much. Well, thank you so much. Uh, thanks for all that you do. I have a question involving the movie Serenity. With Joss Whedon having become more popular than ever due to his work on the Avengers movies, do you think that Serenity came out at the wrong time? A part of me feels that most of the reason why Serenity failed at the box office is because Whedon hasn't, um, wasn't as well known back then as he is today. And that if the movie had been released after the time with the Avengers, then it could have gotten more attention and maybe even made a sequel possible. What are your thoughts on this? Um, thanks a lot for the question, Taylor. I, I gotta say, I there's two parts to the answer, really. In hindsight, after Joss Whedon had done um, uh, Avengers, would that have gotten a Serenity movie then a little bit more attention? It's, it's, it's possible, but remember, Joss Whedon also did, an, he did do another movie after Avengers called Much Ado About Nothing, and, and nobody saw it. Now, granted, it wasn't a wide release film, right. it was not a wide release film, but it was out there and it was available to be seen, and nobody saw it. It is very, very rare. I think Serenity was one of those films, first of all, the show it was based on Firefly got pulled because nobody was watching it. Tragedy, because that show is really good. I love Firefly, and I love Serenity. But it got taken off the air because nobody watched it, and and, and partially that's Fox's fault because I had to move things around, and mm. they just really look up online about how Fox really screwed up that show. Anyway, aired it out of order. Yeah, honestly. all that kind of nonsense. But at the same time, because it wasn't really a highly viewed show, you don't wait seven years to if you're going to make a Serenity movie based on that show that got canceled after one season, you don't wait seven years for it. I don't think it would have been wise to wait that long to have Joss Whedon. And, and let's be honest. Um, I bet if I asked nine out of ten people walking out of Jurassic World, if I could shoot back in time a couple months, and canvas not, all these people coming out of Jurassic World, I bet nine out of ten could not tell you who the director was. They, it didn't matter that they didn't know who Colin Trevorrow was. Right. They went to see Jurassic World. Unless your name is Nolan or a Spielberg, but even Spielberg right now, like Bridge of Spies, solid movie, not killing it at the box office, despite it has arguably the greatest filmmaker of all time doing it. Um, it, it's not really the director's name that pulls in a lot of the general movie going on. It's, I don't know, Christian, when you look at a situation like this, could Serenity have benefited waiting? Would there have been more drawbacks? How do you see all I that? I do think it would have benefited, actually. Um, but I actually think it's a catch-22. And I think that the first part of it is you also remember that even though Serenity might not have done well and Firefly might not have done well, it was very respected among the industry the people, I mean, people who saw it, people who it. Saw it and and yeah. that traveled i mean i worked at silver pictures for a long time people raved about that show and raved and when that movie came out people raved about the movie and he got meetings from it he got more clout from it in the industry because that helped get him avengers was that, joel behind one of the guys behind serenity no 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 oh, no, you're no, talking about no. Joss. No, 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 yeah i'm talking about joss okay. because joel because when i worked for joel like he would, the, Joss worked. There was projects they were working on together. Oh, I, I know. There one were of them. there were a couple. <laughs> there, there were a couple. There were a couple them, yes. And then he came in for meetings, but he got a lot of meetings because of his work. One and of them was a superheroine with the initials WW. But you want to go far into but, that? Yeah, yes. but but anyway, like he he got those meetings because of of his work and because people did respect it. So the one thing is, if you take all that stuff away, then you don't know if he's ever going to get the Avengers because that helped him get the job. But if the director of the Avengers. Not only because I don't disagree with you that a lot of people don't necessarily know the name of the director, but the studios and everyone else do. So if you produce the Avengers and then you do Serenity, you get more money for that project. Mm. Because the difference with Much Ado About Nothing is that he shot it for like two million in his house and he just, did it. He just yeah. did it for himself. As where Serenity, if he had just done the Avengers, you get all this money that he could do that he couldn't put into it the first time. You get this big budget, and then from the director of the Avengers, that does help. Excellent point. And you put the director of the Avengers, you put the budget, you put all this stuff behind it. It might have had a much different result, especially now, especially if we're talking about today, when Star Trek is doing really well. Star Wars is right around the corner. It's a good time That's for That's another element to this equation. It's a great point. It's a good time great for sci-fi fantasy. So I think that, I actually do think it would have benefited very much to release it now. Now that's not to say that a new sequel would do well 
I think it's just past its prime at this point. Schnepp, would, which would be the greater influence here? The benefit of having a Serenity to come out now after Joss Whedon had become a bigger name, or the negative of waiting that long to bring a one season TV show to the movies? Which, was that positive force, or would that negative force be greater, do you think? I think the way it happened is the, the way it should have happened. Like, I don't think where, I mean, if Joss didn't make Serenity, the movie, at that time, you're right. It, he would have done something else, maybe another television series, which would have taken him out of the running to make the Avengers. So, I mean, you know, when you start imagining like multiple universes, right. like this is the Joss that didn't make that. So I don't think he would have returned to Serenity as a film. I think what I'm actually still hoping happens is that now that he does have this this clout from doing Avengers and Avengers Age of Ultron, that he can do a new Firefly television series. Like on one of the, yeah, on a yeah. streaming uh, channel, and and be able to do the thing that he does best as a as a, a series writer mm -hmm. is do a bulk episode kind of like arc, a story arc. I mean, I thought Serenity was great, especially if you loved Firefly. It was really cool. It was cool to see a bigger budget and a continuation of these characters that were short uh, shafted. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. they only got like ten, I think ten or fifteen, or how many episodes? Do you remember? I think I, I think ten, 10 or eleven. Or, I it was eight. Um, you know what the funny thing is? Uh, a true story. I I. So I was late to the Firefly party. I saw Serenity first. Oh wow! Loved it and went. There was a TV show on this, and I went back and watched a show wow. after that and loved that as well. But see, that's a bonus round. Like I love yeah. when that happens. That happens a few <laughs> times with me too. I was like, I remember like Space Above and Beyond. What's that? Oh my God! It's if you've never seen that series, it's a great series. It's like Starship Troopers and Dark Skies mm -hmm. combined. It's a really fun thing. It only lasted one season, but those are the, the kind of fun seasons that I like. I don't need a, something to go like eleven seasons or five seasons. Right. Even sometimes one season is enough where you get the fun out of it. Firefly was one season. I wish it went more, but look, if Joss wants to do more Firefly, tell me he can't right now. Tell me that there's no studio that would be like, we'll give you 20 million. It's his decision. It's his, it's up to, someone will give him that money if he wants to do it. How do you think, okay, let's say for argument's sake, let's say much like the return of uh, Arrested Development, let's say it's now years later. Um, Netflix say puts up $25 million to say, Joss, we want you, because let's, you could probably get everybody back, yeah. uh, notwithstanding, uh, hey, Wendy, what's that show you love? Castle. Castle, notwithstanding Castle. the right. success that he's having. On you know what the funny thing is? Nathan Fillion is having infinite, when it's all said and done, he will have had 3,000 times more success with Castle, but everybody will just think of him uh -huh, yeah. on uh, Firefly. But So let's put up the question. Netflix says, we'll put up $25 million to do another season of Serenity slash Firefly. Do you think today that could be successful? Yeah, definitely. It would be it explosively would? successful, yeah. especially yeah. because of streaming. You have yeah. all the brown coats, all these fans who go to all these conventions and, and have their own chat rooms, their own meetings, their own Facebook pages. It's it would just it would it would be a far bigger success than I think what people are thinking it would be. I think it would be much better to do it on a streaming system than to try to do another two hour movie. I would not I, do a movie. Yet. Yeah, because yeah, I think a movie you, would be I, rough. I think twenty million, even if a studio, I, I think it'd be hard to get a movie, a studio to greenlight a movie, much easier for them to do a series. But you gotta figure out a way to bring Wash back. I don't care what you got to do. <laughs> if you're going to do another season, you got to figure out a way uh, to bring Wash back. All right, let's move on to the next question. Uh, Tyler Hall writes. Hi, guys. Thanks for being part of my daily routine. Well, thank you for making us part of your daily routine, Tyler. Um, what do you think is the ideal running time for a trailer? I know teasers are shorter, but if they wanted to, could a movie release a 7 to 10 minute trailer or would it be against some trailer regulations? Um, it was just about a year ago, I think the MPAA had instituted... No, no, it wasn't the MPAA. It was the it was NATO. It was the National, North America Theater Owners Association. Uh, that put out some new rules and guidelines about how far in advance you can put out trailers, how long the trailers can be. I don't have the specific numbers in front of me. There are limitations. But let's go to that first part of your question. What is the ideal length for a trailer? For me, perfect length is 240. I don't know, that sounds like a random number. I don't know why. To me, 240 is a perfect length. That gives you enough time to really give an audience member a taste of the film, a feel for the temperature of it, uh, introduce you to the major ideas that you need to know about what this movie is to make a decision about go going with it. That being said, since I feel that two minutes and 40 seconds is enough to give you that, a seven to 10 minute preview becomes excess, I think. It's almost like 
We, we don't need it. It's, it's too much. Now, I'm a little bit of a hypocrite saying that at the moment because if I looked on my Twitter feed right now and it said, JJ drops an eight minute trailer for Star Wars The Force Awakens, guess what I'm doing right now? <laughs> um, but, but really honestly, I, I feel 240, that's the length. Teasers, anywhere from a minute to a minute 20, a minute 30, that's good. Yeah. 240 for me is my length. Schnepp, what's the perfect length for a trailer for you? That's funny you said 240. I was gonna say 230, but then I was like, you know, two to 230. I mean, two minutes, two minutes to two and a half minutes. I think once you get over the two, like 245, three minutes, I know it's five, 15 seconds, but it, it starts to add up and you're seeing, they start to show you too much of the trailer, especially with the way the trailers now are so hyper cut. Like you're, they're like, we run out, we ran out of time. Keep showing more of the movie. You're like, what about making a trailer? I'm a big fan of when studios and production houses actually make a trailer, specifically shoot specific sequences just for the trailer to give you a taste of what the film's about, show you some clips actually that are in the movie, but then it's a tracking shot or it's something that's made specifically to get you excited about this movie that's coming out. So, um, yeah, I, and I love trailers. When it gets to seven to eight minutes, what you're talking about is like a preview of the film, which is what we see online a lot of times now. They're like, watch the first 10 minutes. Yeah. And I think I tried that with my film, and it was a great hook. It's like, it's like you know, the first one's free. You know what I mean? Like You're like, I got to see the rest of it. That's why a lot of people do that first. Hey, check out the first 10 minutes, then you decide. And if your film is good. It's a digital pusher is what you're saying. It's a digital pushing, baby. You know it. I'm pimp style, son. That's the way. But I think that works when you have a good product, when you have a good movie, and you give the first 10 minutes away free. The people are like, I want to see the rest. You know, Hopefully, the rest of it isn't garbage. So you're like, but usually that's not the case. So I think when it gets into even seven minutes, that's a lot of time. That's an extra five minutes from what we're talking about you know Christian what about well, I you? think Guardians did that too because I th it's a matter of when, it, when it's like an unknown property in order to, to mm -hmm. throw it out there and let more people know about it especially when you're proud of what you're doing oh, yeah. I think it makes more sense to do like you, it's, it's not it's not really a trailer it's just here's here's 10 minutes or seven minutes of the movie a seven minute trailer is way too much because they give away too much of the movie now in three minutes yes. um, they've done it so much <laughs> we, were we were talking about it with the, the Martian and Southpaw and all this I mean and it seems to be over the last two or three minutes from the way and even what I what I was talking to some people on the inside of things were saying like no they make these decisions to show the movie because it it's it it shows better in numbers it shows better for some reason of getting people in the theater like even when they're, when they're showing too much of the movie for some reason that's helping get people in the theaters I hate it I, um, I would much like, as far as length goes I think you guys are right in this area like 230 240 is perfect you get just enough but that doesn't mean you can't spoil something in 240 oh, as well too yeah. you can spoil something in 30 you, seconds absolutely yeah, really. you can so but i like to i mean i still think you know if we're using the force awakens for i mean the the international trailer i think even though i loved it gave away a little bit more than i think that we should have at this point <laughs> um as where the trailer that came out during monday Night football was the perfect trailer i think it was that's a perfect trailer. i think that's how trailers should be cut in the way that it's like you get the tone of the of the film you know who's in the film but you don't know what the film's about um you, but you'll know enough to no, no, there's not all movies that can do that because Star Wars is Star Wars um, there are other movies that you have to give a little bit more in that 230 240 of what we're going to get as a story otherwise why the hell do I want to watch this movie yeah. um, but I think that that's the length 230 240 you can put together a nice little narrative that gets you interested or, or says this stoinks there's a here's a good example of you can give you can give a huge thing away in just a short amount of time okay so one of the shows we do here on Collider Video is the Flash Recap Show I love the Flash. It's great, but uh, and then this is a little bit of a spoiler. So, so if you haven't seen this week's episode of the Flash, you might want to tune out for a second, okay? But but most of you probably seen it if you watch the show at all. La, 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 la. <laughs> so <laughs> it, the episode ends with Barry paralyzed, and his he can't feel his legs. That's how the episode ends. And then you know how when a show's over, they say stay tuned for a, a look at next week's episode of the Flash. And it's like a 15 second thing. And they show Barry running around fighting next week's villain. Uh, it's like, well, I guess the paralysis right. isn't a big deal because right. and so, you know, major so spoiler. That's true. But you know, normally that doesn't happen with, with, with like TV shows. I mean, even like, well, the perfect example of that is Walking Dead. And I won't go into much about it. There's something that happened this season right. that happened. And it's just like, well, let's see the trailers to see if, if, if we think what's happened is going to happen. <laughs> and they don't show that thing at right, all. You're like, yeah. well, how about this? So a lot of times they're good with doing that. Yeah, but that was one that's, example that's a good of example, it really yeah. giving it away. Mm -hmm. All right, last mailbag question today, and this one's from Tyler Owens, who writes, Hello, Collider Crew. Thanks for all you guys do. I was writing uh, about that you guys just reported on the new X-Men Apocalypse trailer, more than likely being attached to Star Wars Episode Seven. 
I know that you've talked about uh, you have talked about a lot of times that it doesn't matter if a trailer is attached to a movie because it'll be online a couple days before. But I think it does play a big deal because what what about all the people who aren't that plugged into the movie community like we are and are just learning about this movie when they are watching Star Wars? Thanks so much. Well, yeah. So what Tyler's basically talking about is. You know, I believe, and we've said on the show, that gone are the days of, you know, like when the Phantom Menace came out, what movie is the Phantom Menace trailer going to be playing with? Right. Because that's how you saw trailers. But now, <clears throat> trailers never premiere with a movie. They're always premiere online. They're always online first, unless you are, of course, the new Star Wars trailer, which dropped on Monday Night Football. But they made an event out of that. There was a purpose for that. But... And so I say gone are the days when it really matters. But, but Tyler, I believe, here does raise a very valid point. Like, what about the people who are not plugged in? The people who don't watch Movie Talk. The people who don't read Collider.com. The people who don't read Entertainment Weekly. What about them? That is a great point. Now, I would suggest that the people who seeing these tra trailers mean the most to are watching Movie Talk, are reading Collider.com, are reading Entertainment Weekly, that sort of thing. But, but you do raise a good point. There's another segment where... Look, this is why the studios want their trailers playing in front of these big movies, is to get that audience, to show to that. Plus, not only that, but you put it online, anybody can watch it. You put it in a movie theater, in a trailer, that's called target marketing. Right. You are showing your trailer to active movie goers. That is the prime people you want to be hitting with this. And not only they're seeing your trailer, they're not seeing it on this dinky little computer screen. They're watching it on a big movie screen with a surround with like with all this beautiful sound. So you're absolutely right, Taylor. I think I do overplay the fact that the importance of what tr movie a trailer opens with. I think I do overplay that. I, I think there is a segment of that. Christian, what do you think? But to, uh, honestly, defending you on this point here is that I don't think that we've ever said on this show that, that they weren't important to the movies. I think that we, what we've said is that it doesn't matter that if it's dropped in the movie theater first. Mm -hmm. Right. That right. was always the point that yeah, I always right. got from the conversation. Right. I don't think we ever downplayed how important a trailer is for, for a movie theater. Oh, going. never. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's crucial because for the point of t what Taylor's saying here is that because when you go, my wife being someone who really learns about trailers, unless I show her something, she learns about it when we go to the movies. That's the first time she's seeing it. It's the way a lot of people go, they're casual movie viewers. So I think, but I, again, I would say that it is, we know how important it has to be, and especially for something like Star Wars. I mean, that's, that's like Super Bowl advertising right, right. there. Um, you're gonna be, you are going to be putting, you're gonna get some of the big movies. You'll get a Batman v Superman, I assume. You'll get some of these big trailers, especially movies that are coming out, whether it be in February, March, and then in, playing into May, a Civil War trailer. I mean, that's your audience, man. So yeah, it, it's it's crucial to do that because, and going back into the energy that you're going to have in the Star Wars crowd, it is, again, crucial to get that excitement as opposed to someone who's, again, watching it on the, on the little computer, as opposed to how we're all going to be right. like kids in a candy store Can on opening night of Star Wars. Can you imagine the uh -huh. three of us? Because we, uh, I, I can't remember if you're going to be there with us on the, the, the uh, 17th. I'm, I'm on the 17th, but I'm at Universal. Or Universal, but like Dennis, myself, Wendy, Schnepp, uh, there's, there, but we are like, oh, can you imagine us in that theater on the 17th? Screaming like children. Yeah, a, with, with a thousand with other people else. screaming like children. And that's like what I'm children. saying, so yeah. imagine, especially the host of heroes sitting there, <laughs> and then, boom, Apocalypse comes in. Boom, yeah. Civil War. He's going to lose. He's going to pop a blood vessel. It's, it's, <laughs> it's, 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 so it's very smart to put the movies there. Well, you know, the way I look at it is like it, we all went to go see that uh, Force Awakens like 30 seconds right. or however long yeah, it was. Yeah, the three right. of us went to go yeah. see that together. Yeah, And it was so much fun to see it the way we're supposed to see it in a giant theater i mean that's that's the way these films these are blockbuster event films they're made they're shot they're totally designed to be seen in a massive format to enjoy because that's the way they're made when you see these trailers really tiny with a, a tinny audio i mean that's how a lot of some of these trailers these giant massive trailers that's how a lot of them i've seen because i'm like well, i'm definitely going to see this movie and it's going to be this trailer is going to be playing before it but i have to see this right, right now, now yeah. and i'm watching it on a tiny like a little postage stamp thing and it's stuttering and it's it's like streaming, to, you know, buffering. You're like, no, you know, so it's worth it. What, to an AOL die up? I know. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I got, you know. Snap, I'd like to introduce you yeah. to 2005. Well, <laughs> at, 
truth be said, there's a lot of people who actually are on the internet who don't watch trailers. There's people who are like, oh, yeah. yeah. Right. I mean, it's like, and, and then you're talking also to older people who do go see uh, see movies who were, are completely unaware and not, you know, in My like mom would are. like to thank you for pointing her out, by yes. the way. Yes, <laughs> Miss Campia. <laughs> your son is doing a great job. I just want to let you know whichever <laughs> camera you're at. Um, so, yeah, I think trailers are awesome. I, I, I agree with both sides. I think it's like, yeah, eventually it'll be online. But I think putting this emphasis on like, hey, when's this trailer? Oh, this trailer is opening before Star Wars. Now that we all know that, that adds just for us a little yeah. extra excitement, knowing that Civil War and now X-Men Apocalypse, hopefully both will be attached to the Star Wars trailer. I mean, look at Mark Ellis. Well, Mark did re re recently. I'd rather not. Yeah, sorry. Uh, <laughs> watch a Topher Grace movie. It's better. Uh, we, you know, but what he did recently, he watched the the trailer for Star Wars when it came out, and then he went, and then he knew that there was a, it was going to play before a certain movie, and he wanted to go see it on the big screen. So he mm, went yeah. again, and it's like, it is, it's for the fans. It's for everybody else who hasn't seen it. All right, folks. Well, listen, I said we would uh, take the, the entire second half of the show to take your Twitter questions, and we're going to do that in just a minute. You can start sending in some questions via Twitter. Now, listen, forgive me. This might be a, a little awkward and weird because we don't have a dedicated host here today picking them out. I'm going to do my best to keep up with you guys, but you can start sending in tweets now. How do you send in a question to us? First of all, follow us on Twitter, at Collider Video, and then just tweet us questions, at Collider Video, and I'll pick a, a bunch out that I... as. Uh, as well as I can, I'm going to do my best. Remember what I tell you guys all the time? You guys think the hosting job in the show is huh. easy. Look at me doing it. It is not easy. Well, you got Clocky with you, so. Yeah. Now, Clocky is with me today, so Clocky will pull me through. All right. Wasn't Clocky facing the other way before? No. Is, it, is he counter-Clocky now? No, he's always been there. Okay, anyway. Now you're freaking me out. But first... <laughs> Before we get to the Twitter question, we're talking a little bit about what is opening this week, brought to you by our friends at AMC Theaters. Now, on Tuesday, we told you about the one wide release film, which is the 33. There's another film playing in over 2,000 theaters this week, and that is Love the Coopers. Love the Coopers follows the Cooper clan as four generations of extended family come together for their annual Christmas Eve celebration. As the evening unfolds, a series of unexpected visitors and unlikely events Turn the Night Upside Down. The film stars the ensemble of Alan Arkin, John Goodman, Ed Helms, Diane Keaton, Diane, uh, Diane Mackey, Anthony Mackey, Amanda Seyfried, Marissa Tomei, and Olivia Wilde. Christian. Yeah. Should people be looking forward to Love the Coopers? I saw this movie uh, the other day, and I will say this. I'll give it, I'm going to give it a rating of an A. Awesome. Atrocious. Oh. It is atrocious. This Bummer. is in my top 10 of the worst of the year. No. It's so bad. It is so bad. And I'll tell you why. One of the reasons it's as an all star well, cast. I'm I was sucked in by I'm looking at all the stars. I love, oh, no. and I love. I love good Christmas movies. I love oh. bad Christmas movies. This is a bad, bad Christmas movie. Oh. Uh, it is so stupid. And everyone's... It's, it's like normally... I like cliched movies sometimes that they're done well. Uh, this isn't even that. It's like it's it's everyone's fighting. The characters are never developed. There's the, the, It's the director does not know how to shoot comedy. It is painful. And Ed Helms, who I like, has two stinking comedies back to oh, back now. Vacation. Yeah, and yeah, I this. thought Olivia Wilde, your girl, is is really good. Oh, Olivia. She's she's <laughs> good. I would have liked to have seen her story and her character maybe be more of it. It's like what they did with Valentine's Day. It's like all these different characters and ensembles and and then Alan Arkin's in some weird, creepy uh, story angle with, with Amanda Seyfried. And, it's, and, and when you find out Who's narrating the the story? You're like, okay, that explains everything. It is, oh, it, it is, it is garbage, garbage. Uh, <laughs> Shep, have you been but looking you forward up, up until Christian Harloff's? <laughs> Just tore my heart out here. here. So on the have ground. you been looking forward to love the pissed Coopers? on it? <laughs> so then ground it up. Uh, not anymore. Now I hate the Coopers. No, I mean, yeah. you know what? It's like, uh, yeah. I don't know what to say. I'm stunned. As you know, as as we love to say, it's opinions. Maybe some people out there, you know, there's going to be other critics who are like, I thought it was one of the greatest. It's got a zero percent on Rotten Tomatoes. Oh right God! Now. All right, zero <laughs> percent. Rest my. I can't say anything. <laughs> hey, look! All I can say is all those actors have been in other amazing films. John they have Goodman. a lot of good ones. Check out John Goodman it, and Barton Fink, ladies and there's gentlemen. There's nothing that yeah, they can do. All the, it's the acting. There's there's oh. only one bad actor in the movie, but I'm not going to say who it is because. Right. 
He's young. All right. So, um, yeah. But other than that, it's it's a it. it I don't care who. Give, give how me a are. comparison just so I could have it visually in my mind to another garbagey Christmas. Egg movie. farts. Does that work? No. Egg oh, farts. no. Is that, is, Egg that's farts. All right. that, the that, movie that will yeah. clear the theater. Yeah. yeah. All right. That's, that was the original title of the film. Oh man. All right, folks. Well, now <laughs> let's get to your Twitter questions. I'm doing my best to keep up to date with them. Once again, you can send in your questions to at Collider Video. We're gonna start off with this. Kruger ten or eleven is writing. With all the negativity towards DC, do you think people are going to hate Batman versus Superman no matter how good it is? Um, yes, because there are real stupid people out there. Um, I, I look. I will never understand. I, I've said this before. I will say it again. I will never understand this mentality of, I'm a DC person. I'm a Marvel person. You know what I am? I'm a good movie person. I like good movies. And this whole notion is, oh, I, I hope Batman versus Superman sucks. I hope the Wonder Woman movie sucks. Or I hope the new Avengers sucks. Like, why? Why, why would you be so stupid to want that? Don't you want good movies? And like, I just, and I'll also never get over these people who so freely relinquish their free will to become corporate slaves to their corporate master. I will do whatever Marvel says. I will do whatever DC says. Be a movie fan. But yeah, there are idiots out there who, look, there are people out there who are not going to like Batman versus Superman. And that's totally fair. That's why movies are subjective. Nothing wrong with that. But there are people out there who have predecided to, no matter what happens, Batman versus Superman could be the greatest film of all time. And they're still going to say it sucks. Why? Because they're slaves to Marvel, because mm -hmm. they're mindless Marvel drones, and they're just going to say Batman versus Superman sucks, no matter what. Just as there are mindless DC fanboy drones who are just going to say Ant Man sucks, Guardians again, because it's Marvel. I will never. For the life of me, understand this mentality, gentlemen. I'll never get it. I like good movies. I hate bad movies. I, guess what? Marvel's not put out all gold. Right. DC has put out some great films. I, it's just love great movies. But yes, to answer your question, there are going to be people out there who will dislike it. They've already decided to dislike it. There are people out there who have done that. Schnepp, your reaction? To that. Haters gonna hate. Haters gonna, gonna hate. Haters gonna hate because there's uh, there's people who uh, you know just like. And I'm what a will Aners do? Aners gonna ain't. <laughs> And just they hate that us that <laughs> yeah. So, and we could even bring a similarity to Star Wars. Like blind love of Star Wars means you're putting up the blast doors. You're the blast shields on. They're like, hey, nice look. Nice analogy. Hey, I like that. Well done. Get, you can look at everything. Not everything is great, and just because it's in you don't. And you're not. And you're not like betraying anyone because you're, if like, I, I I love everything Marvel. I think you know there's a there's a disconnect when people like are are allegiant to one form of whatever it's like especially if it's a, a genre picture like science fiction or fantasy or now that we have the superhero genre um sure has dc had a bunch of stinkers in a row yes has marvel had like an insane amount of hits all in a row that are all great that established this like cinematic universe while dc's like trying to catch up you know Yes, but that doesn't mean it can't flip flop in five years and you're looking at the decimation of the Marvel Universe and all of a sudden DC's just leave as like 30 movies. That's not going to happen. But I'm saying it could happen. And then where would your hatred go? Nowhere. I mean, hate is a bad energy. Listen to Yoda. It's like, you know what I'm saying? It's like it's it's a waste of time. To, uh, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's hatred is f just a full on waste of time. So if if you're not feeling good about your life and you're looking in the mirror and bumming out about yourself, do something to make yourself happy. Don't like inflict it on like poor innocent DC characters who haven't done anything to you yet. So. Yeah, and, and to defend DC, but it's not like DC's put on a long string of stingers in a row. We had the Dark Knight. Oh yeah, no, I was uh, just saying, it's, Batman, it's, it's, or, uh, oh, Man of Steel. Yeah, we had, Nolan did uh, there's Green, so there's much Green to Lantern. make the the DC <laughs> world like vibrant and like billions of dollars and put that name of Batman back where it should be, the top. So it's, yeah. you know, I mean, those characters are always going to be like in fighting, and those companies were always like having you know, haha, DC visit my, back and forth with Marvel for years. You know, so I think it's weird that fans are taking on that kind of strange animosity. There's no reason for it. Yeah, people got to realize this ain't the Red Sox and the Yankees. It's like to, to, to DC and Marvel, it might be, you know, because they're competing businesses. Right. But to us, like John said, we, we benefit from it. It's a good movie. And we're as movie fans, it's like you get to see Batman versus Superman. If you are a movie fan, you get to see Batman and Superman in the same movie. And just because you like Ant-Man and Iron Man better than those characters, as a movie fan, as a superhero fan, you should be embracing that and not just hating it because like, I'm Marvel. 
viral. Yeah. It's like that's silly. And, and I think that people will, a lot of people will do that for some reason. They think that this loyalty is there. But I also think there are a lot of people out there who are just going to go in there, benefit of the doubt. I think that the percentage of is, is the majority of people that are going to see the movie are hoping to love it. Yes. Yeah. Um, even if they wind up, maybe, there are a lot of people that are just hard to please and they'll wind up hating it anyway, but they're going in, hoping, ah, it might suck, but I want to like it. That's fine. And I think that like I would go high enough to say there's like 80, 85% of movie people that are going to see it are going to see the movie because they want to see Batman and Superman. Well, here's the thing, too. You bring up a great example. I just want to elaborate. This isn't the Yankees versus the Red Sox. Because in order for the Red Sox to win, that means the Yankees have to lose. In order for the Yankees to win, that means the Red Sox have to lose. Guess what? When the Avengers makes a billion dollars, DC doesn't lose. Their movie is still going to make tons and tons of money. And it helps their genre. And it helps the genre. I've been saying that all the time. That Guess what? When people go out to the movie, if you're Batman versus Superman, right? Or what's the movie that comes? Yeah, if you're Batman versus Superman, okay, Fox is Deadpool coming out a few months before. Guess what? Fox or Marvel wants that Deadpool movie to be freaking awesome. Mm -hmm. Why? Because they want movie going fans to go to a comic book movie and have an awesome time yeah. so that when the next comic book movie out there, like we got to go back to the right, theater. Right. This is not a win or lose situation. This is a potential win win for everybody. And I just don't understand the adversarial. Uh, idea and of it. competition, man. It's always a good thing because it's like good thing, healthy competition. Yeah, healthy competition. Because again, like if you have like say Batman versus Superman, that crushes. Okay, even those naysayers are gonna be like, all right, Civil War. What do you got? <laughs> and then they're gonna go right. see it to see if Civil War can compete with Batman v Superman. Uh, Doctor Superstar in the chat board is saying, give the Yankees back to Marvel. Okay. <laughs> uh, next question comes from XP Carroll, who writes. Uh, we saw Makuga and Dennis review the Warcraft trailer on Friday, but I want to know what the OG crew <laughs> thinks of it. Thanks. You know, and I got to apologize on Mailbag. Um, I had said on Mailbag this past weekend, hey, guys, I'll, I'll do my own little video review of the, the Warcraft thing. And then I just didn't think anybody cared. So I didn't do it. And then I've been getting all these tweets from people saying, hey, you promised us this. OK, so let's do that now. Um, I really liked it. I, I really liked it um, because when I, you know what, when I've watched the first few minutes of Lord of the Rings, uh, uh, The Fellowship of the Ring, right, mm -hmm. I instantly fell in love with it because instantly in the first two minutes of that movie, I remember I've been reading The Hobbit and Lord of the Rings since I was a kid and I felt transported to that world. I, when I watched that movie, I felt like I was taken to Middle Earth and I felt it was there. It. It, they brought, they manifested everything my imagination had conceived, and it brought me there. And that's the awe and wonder. That's the the X factor of a lot of movies. Watching the Warcraft trailer for me, I'm not it, not the best trailer of the year, or anything, nothing like that. But when I started watching that Warcraft trailer, I got to tell you, man, it took me to Azeroth. Mm. I felt like it it was the manifestation of a lot of what my imagination had believed. Now, me and uh, Dennis had talked about this a little bit. Did some of the visual effects look a little animated to me? Yes, they did. But I've been saying this for years and it's still true. Never judge visual effects that are created, made, and tailored for being projected on a big screen in a certain way by watching them on thing. I've seen movies that had great visual effects in the theater and then I've watched it on television later and suddenly that visual effect looked crappy because that's not how it was tailored. Um, so. I would say don't read too much into the visual effect. I thought the hot orc girl was a little weird. I did think that was a little weird, but other than that, um, I, I like I enjoyed the trailer. I'm not jumping up and down about it, but like I said, it took me to Azeroth personally, so I I, I enjoyed the trailer. I really did. Christian, what do you think about it? I didn't see the trailer yet. I still haven't watched. What? It. I know. Really? I still haven't watched it yet. Um, I it, like sometimes sometimes if I have if I have I think it's gonna be more of a, this is a teaser trailer as well too. I think it was like a full two no, plus. Is it a full, it full, full trailer? trailer? Yeah. Okay. I mean, like, some unless sometimes I like to hold off on trailers unless obviously we're reviewing them for the show and I wasn't on the show when they reviewed it, so I was like, okay, you know, I'm gonna hold off on it and then maybe when there's a, a more a full, a fuller trailer, maybe you'll get lucky and your first experience will be in front of another on movie a screen, on screen. So, yeah. yeah. So. Well, I really enjoyed it. Having uh, having Warcraft helped ruin my very first company in 1995 because <laughs> I had all my computers linked and we were chopping wood and uh, getting gold and I was instead researching. Instead of making movies. Instead of making, uh, <laughs> and it's like, huh, it seems like we should probably get a job in order to sustain this, uh, you know, anyway. 
I loved every minute of playing Warcraft, and this was the overhead, the StarCraft style Warcraft, where you're like, like getting Warcraft a bunch one of yeah. And so, I was yeah. always the orcs, you know. I was always like a dude researching death and decay, so I could crisp some people on the other side. I was that dude, and uh, I loved it. So I never went into the whole campaigning like what you did when you played Warcraft, the the newer versions of Warcraft. Throw all that stuff aside. This movie, the trailer for it. I think it's going to be great because what they're doing, especially Duncan Jones as a director and someone who's like a writer director as well. Uh, I don't know if he wrote the Warcraft film. I don't know if he's had a, a part in it, but it feels like they're concentrating on making the orcs just as important and emotionally balanced as the humans. It really does. Yeah. Because you really have to have that. It's not like Lord of the Rings. The orcs are evil. They're manifestation. My, kind of mindless. Yeah, yeah manifestation yeah. of evil. In this trailer, this first full-length trailer of Warcraft, you see that the orcs are a society and that they as well are being forced into war. And they, as some of them, might not want to be part of this war. So you can already see that they're like creating the different main characters and that they're fighting and struggling on their own, yet they still have to fight each other. I thought the special effects for the orcs looked fantastic. I love the way they have those human eyes because that with the the uncanny valley that we we are still suffering through because we are so almost there with like everything looks real when it's a desk or it's a computer or it's a car but if it's a human you're like that looks weird you know so you know there's a guy who jumps 30 feet and then hard lands on a flying griffin or something I was like that's a little you know I think he'd break and fall apart if he did that I'd in real love, life. I loved it, actually. But it was cool. So, I mean, there's the sacrifice where you have, like, that's a, just a cool shot. It's like, I'll see you in hell, and jumping and landing on a weird creature. <laughs> that's, that's, like, that's the thing that fantasy is made of. It's not made of reality. So that would never happen. Guess what? A weird flying griffin isn't real either. Neither, neither is that dragon or the orc. So you, you kind of just have to go with it. And I think this Warcraft movie is going with it but it's got it, to me what i liked most about it is it had just this different edge to it it didn't feel like a run of the mill you know sword and sandals sword and sorcery film it felt like it's going to come at it with something different and you know we've been going to all these conventions where you see all these like armor the, all the different armor and the amazing effects that i believe it's weta they're doing it right i think so yeah I it's just an so. incredible amount of amazing detail and all the armor and you kind of get lost in that when you're looking at that as like yeah it's going to just be another war film then you see the trailer it feels like it's going to be something different all right we've got time for just a few more brandon azp writes any chance of a step brothers two you know, it's, it's funny you ask that question because just the other night, there were a couple people on our crew, Wendy, Kaori, uh, and Dennis was in the office, but Wendy and Corey had never seen Step Brothers. You know, I still have never seen it. Really? Are you? No, I'm not kidding around. Oh. I've still never seen Step Brothers. Look at his stunned King face. Yeah, I was like, <laughs> offended. I told you I, that before. I, 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 I totally forgot. I love no, I know. Step love Brothers. Me. I love that movie. That movie makes me just howl. It's so ridiculous, mm -hmm. but it, the balance of it throughout is so well. Even like the secondary characters, like Adam Scott is really funny in it. Um, Rob, uh, uh, Rob Riggle. Riggle. Yeah, it was the first time I ever really saw Rob Riggle in anything was in that. Anyway, uh, so I showed it. So we were here one night. Me and Dennis was here. Uh, Carrie and Wendy had never seen. It. I said, yeah, "Okay, just hold the phone. We gotta watch Step Brothers." And we sat here and watched Step Brothers. I don't. I think if a Step Brothers two was gonna happen, it would have happened by now. Yeah. Um, I think Farrell's really busy. McKay is really busy. Um, I don't see them going back to that. But man, would I? I would be. I would be even more excited for a Step Brothers two than I am for Zoolander two. I actually like Step Brothers even more than Zoolander. I would be more up for that as well too, but I don't think it's going to happen because it also it, it wasn't a huge hit. It did okay, but it wasn't. No, it, in theaters it, it was it was not a big hit. You no, know, it wasn't a big hit, and that's that's tough on a comedy. Nor was it critically received well. No, it wasn't, and I I didn't love it as much as you did. There were certainly some moments in there that I that were hysterical. I thought the first half was a lot funnier than the second, but I uh, although the ending is amazing. Um, but I think that and also find me five. Put your hand up and name me five comedy sequels that work, and you'll be hard pressed to do it. It's hard, it's really hard. Not to say they don't get made, right, right. but it's you know it's tough to it's tough to make a successful comedy sequel, whatever reason that is. All right, let's take the next one, and the next one comes to us from uh, Alden Ett, who writes: Will there be a collider meetup in London? outside of the Star Wars convention for those of us who can't get in. Um, yeah, that's a good question. So basically, 
The point beyond this one is that uh, there is a Star Wars celebration coming up. The next one is going to be in London. I believe it's in July. July. And we are talking about going to it. We haven't established that we're going, but we believe we're going to take a bunch of us from the crew and go to London and uh, go to Star Wars Celebration. I'll tell you this. Absolutely. If we're in London, you can bet your ass we're going to plan a meet and greet. Yeah. We're going to plan, a, like, we'll get a pub or we'll get yeah, something like that. And drink. A yeah, meet exactly. and drink. We'll plan a meet and drink. <laughs> um, I don't drink, but whatever. I'll have Diet Pepsi. We're going to get Campia drunk. Do you, oh, have, yeah. do you have Diet Pepsi in London? They I don't do. Know. Is that but they, call, they would say Diet Pepsi. Diet yeah. Pepsi. Yeah. Diet Pepsi. Um, and we will definitely come. You know, for years we've always gotten, uh, you, the people who watch us in London, you guys have always been so great to us and all the stuff you write in. So, yes, we will absolutely do uh, set up a meet and greet and in London. How when, should we set that up? When well, First of all, we should go meet at the World's End. That's a great pub. That's great. Um, Is that anywhere near the convention center, though? It's central London, but... Um, when does Rogue One come out? Rogue One comes out in December, a, a year from oh, they're now. They're doing another a, another Christmas release. I thought they yeah, were rock no, back that, to summer. That's only for the uh, saga film. So episode eight will be in May of oh, okay. 2017. Got it. Okay, this question comes from Rad Film Circle, who writes: Thoughts on a George Lucas biopic? Thanks for doing what you guys mm. do. You know what? I've I've never really thought that a George Lucas biopic would be all that all that interesting. I thought they were cool until I read. I knew it. Um, uh, how, how Star Wars conquered the universe. Yeah, After that, I read that, it's like, are you effing kidding the me? Car crash, like everything, like this. everything. If, I didn't even realize. That, I mean, I knew he had been in a car crash, but like, had he not gotten into that car crash, Jedi Council doesn't exist. <laughs> you know, like all the, <laughs> Star Wars is obviously just, is the main thing that doesn't exist. It. If you have not read How Star Wars Conquered the Universe by Chris Taylor, I implore you to do that. It really really goes over a lot of his thought process a lot like personal stuff that he went through but also creative decisions the people involved in his life i think it would be an incredible idea to do a george lucas biopic i think i mean what part of his life do you focus on like the jobs movie to me was like i wanted it to be like an hour longer yeah because there's so much more that they didn't cover that's super important to the rest of the planet um with something like george lucas like his dad was basically the emperor you know what I mean? And he was like writing Star Wars like it's like, a, you know, he's daddy issues. And he's, you know, I mean, it's like his entire like just his college history with like hanging out with like Francis Ford Coppola and like John Milius and all these other oh, crazy. Palma, I, mean, like everybody. I mean, come on, man. I mean, he almost directed Apocalypse Now. He I mean, was supposed to for a long I know. time. Yeah, yeah. Very I mean, that's time, I mean, yeah. just a one year like sliver of like this crazy year in college with those yeah, guys. Man. So that's a movie. I mean, George Lucas's autobiography. There's there's several of them there, and I would love to see any version of those movies. You know what the thing is, though. I and you know, not to sound morbid here, but I don't think it's going to happen until after he passes, um, because he's a very private person in general. Um, yeah. And when people have gone to write books about him, he this is also mentioned in this in how Star Wars conquered the universe is like he the guy that was writing his autobiography Lucas was didn't like the way he was portrayed in that book and wanted him to rewrite stuff. He's like, well, that's not how it works, George. You know, and it's, and so George is not going to sign off on things. There's, there's a certain way he doesn't want to be portrayed. And you know, some things are true, things are true, but he might not want this stuff. Like I know that his divorce obviously very painful for him and that right. would have to be a big part of it. So I don't think you're gonna see it until years after he passes. Yeah, yeah, I agree. But it would be interesting. Yeah. All right, folks, we're approaching the hour mark. So it's time for us to cut this thing short. Thank you so much for joining us today for this installment of Collider Movie Talk. Listen, don't forget, Lots of great films playing at our friends over at AMC Theaters. Head on over to www.amctheaters.com for all of your theater, showtime, and of course, your movie ticket information. And listen, if you love entertainment news, make sure you bookmark Collider.com. The writers over there doing a great job of keeping you up to date on everything going on in the world of film and television. Once again, bookmark Collider.com. I want to thank the guys sitting at the table with me. First of all, sitting on my left, Mr. John Schnepp. Schnepp, where can people find you online? Well, you guys can follow me on Twitter and Instagram, just at John Schnepp. You can find my film, The Death of Superman Lives, What Happened, on Showtime Networks. And if you like it, go buy the Blu-ray or get the digital Super Pack, which has like eight hours of extra features, by going to www.tdoslwh.com. Sitting over here on my right, Mr. Christian Harloff. Christian, where can people find you? At Christian Harloff, both Twitter and Instagram. And thank you for all the Star Wars questions. I get a bunch every day. Love it. And thanks for watching Phantom Menace. Speaking of Star Wars, Collider Jedi Council. Today, myself and John Campia and our special guest, Justin Bolger, will be talking Star Wars. Lots of stuff to talk about. Sorry, Dennis.
<laughs> and of course, you can follow me on Facebook and on Twitter at John Cambio. You can find the three of us plus Mark Ellis online right now with our Star Wars The Phantom Menace commentary if you want to find that. Uh, and just subscribe to our YouTube channel, guys. we got so much stuff going on here. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and be kept up to date with everything that we're doing. And take this video. Share it on your Twitter. Share it on your Facebook. Help spread the word about it. That'll do it for us, guys. Thanks so much for joining us. For Collider Video, my name is John Campion. And until next time, bye-bye. Hey guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.